Welcome back to Open Secrets. This is episode 13, and it is part four of The Creature from Jekyll Island by G. Edward Griffin. And in this show, we will be concluding The Creature from Jekyll Island. And there is still so much more information that we're going to get into, and very important information because G. Edward Griffin kind of puts a very nice bow on this subject. Last episode, we got into the history of the Civil War, the real true history of the Civil War, and the history of the early banks of central banks of the United States of America, the Federal Reserve now, which we are currently operating on under, is the fourth central bank. And you can see here in this uh, book, there's he does include some pretty cool pictures, and you can see uh, President Andrew Jackson, as we talked very briefly about. Unfortunately, there's so much good information in this book, we got to skip a lot of it. But uh, President Andrew Jackson was a vehement opponent of the central bank, and his opponent at the time, Nicholas Biddle, was the primetime central banker of the nation and was his opponent. You can see some artist depictions of what was going on in the Civil War in the North, and I didn't talk about this because, again, there's all these pieces of awesome information I leave out, so read the book, please. But um, the, s the North and the North during the Civil War, they, people actually did not just hop on board with what, with the war, and there was a lot of, of rioting that was going on. I did mention the, that Russia came to the aid of the North, and here's a picture of some of the Russian sailors on one of their ships. Um, this is stuff we're going to get in, so that was last episode, stuff we're going to get in today. Briefly, we're going to talk about Montague Norman, who is the head of the um, Central Bank of, of, uh, of England. Um, William Wentworth, I don't think we're going to talk about him, but here we get into some Rockefellers. You can see John D. Rockefeller Sr. giving a coin to a little child. This is a quite evil man, and they use their nice propaganda pieces to paint him as this wonderful person so that people didn't go up in arms. You have John D. Rockefeller III on the right here is giving a check to Trigba Lee for the amount of $8.5 million. William Trigba Lee was the first Secretary General of the United Nations. No big deal, right, folks? We have William Jennings Bryan, who we will mention briefly. And he was the basically the head of the Democrat Party that eventually had to be that had to be convinced to get on board with the Federal Reserve Act. Eventually he was, obviously. And then here's uh, Alan Greenspan, who was the chairman of the central of the federal reserve in 90s when this book was written this section section five is called the harvest and jader describes it thus monetary and political scientists continue to expound the theoretical merits of the federal reserve system it has become a modern act of faith that economic life simply could not go on without it but the time for theory is past. The creature moved into its final layer in 1913 with the Federal Reserve Act and has snorted and thrashed about the landscape ever since. If we wish to know if it is a creature of service or a beast of prey, we merely have to look at what it has done. And after the test of all those years, we can be sure that what it has done, it will continue to do. Or to use the biblical axiom, a tree shall be known by the fruit it bears. Let us examine the harvest. So, the summary, because J. Edward Griffin does summary, so I will read the summaries and then we'll go back should there be any further details I want to get into in each chapter. Summary 20. Uh, the London Connection is the name of this chapter. After the Civil War, America experienced a series of expansions and contractions of the money supply, leading directly to economic booms and busts. And there were several booms and busts after the Civil War. This was a result of the creation of fiat money by a banking system, which, far from being free and competitive, was a halfway house to central banking. Throughout the chaos, one banking firm, the House of Morgan, was able to prosper out of the failure of others. Morgan had close ties with the financial structure and culture of England and was, in fact, more British than American. Events suggest the possibility that Morgan and company was in concealed partnership with the House of House of Rothschild throughout most of this period. Benjamin Strong was a Morgan man and was appointed as the first governor of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which rapidly assumed dominance over the system. Strong immediately entered into close alliance with Montague Norman, governor of the Bank of England, to save the English economy from depression. This was accomplished by deliberately creating inflation in the U.S., 
creating inflation, which caused an outflow of gold and lo a loss of foreign markets, unemployment, and speculation in the stock market, all of which were factors that propelled America into the crash of 1929 and the depression of the 30s. So we see a, a deliberate construction of the crash in the Great Depression. Although not covered in this chapter, it must be remembered that the same forces were responsible for the American involvement in both world wars to provide the economic and military resources England needed to survive. Furthermore, the key players in this action were men who were part of the network of a secret society established by Cecil Rhodes for the expansion of the British Empire. And the section I want to read from this chapter and. I'm actually going to only read the summaries in the next few chapters because the end of this book has a lot of awesome information. But the section from this that I found most interesting, again, it's all interesting, so please read it for yourself, is about the House of Morgan specifically. <clears throat> the close relationship between the Morgans and Great Britain was no accident. J.P. Morgan Jr. was the driving force behind the Council on Foreign Relations. If you recall, I did an episode on the secret society known as the skull and bones which is a fundamental piece of american history that is just left out i highly suggest you go and watch that episode and then more importantly read the book that that episode is about what well, they talk about how the skull and bones is also incredibly important in the council of foreign relations in fact in that book anthony sutton makes the case that the there is an organization within the Council on Foreign Relations, which is controlled by the Skull and Bones, which ultimately controls the Council on Foreign Relations, but nonetheless, J.P. Morgan Jr. certainly was a driving force behind the CFR. The American branch of a secret society established by Cecil Rhodes for the expansion of the British Empire. In truth, the Morgans were more British than American. And we're going to go turn back the clock a little bit and look at the origins of the Morgan fortune. Eventually, the Morgan fortune, through Henry Davison, was who Dav Davison was a skull and bones. Davison was a Morgan representative in the meeting that eventually led to the creation of the Federal Reserve Act. But Davison eventually, through influence of the skull and bones, they took over the Morgan company. That's why there are no more Morgans running JP Morgan. It's Morgan Stanley. Stanley was also a skull and bonesman. Here we go. Junius Morgan selected by Peabody. Peabody was a British socialite banker who helped adopt the Morgan family into this banking system. When the Boston merchant Junius Morgan, Junius Morgan met George Peabody at a London dinner party in 1850, important history here, little did he realize that the elder financier took an immediate liking to him and began to discreetly inquire into his background and reputation. This began an extended period of business and social contact that eventually extended, ended in 1854 when Junius moved his family to London and became a full partner in the firm, which eventually became known as Peabody, Morgan & Company. In addition to selling bonds in England for American commercial ventures and state governments, the partnership also became the chief fiscal agent for the Union government during the Civil War. And it was during this period that the firm's great profits pushed into the top echelons of London's financial fraternity. In 1864, Peabody finally retired and completely turned the business over to Junius, who immediately changed the firm's name to J.S. Morgan and Company. Junius's son, John Pierpont, attended the English high school in Boston, during much of his youth was enrolled in European schools and became engulfed in British tradition. He had been born in the United States, however, and that made him ideally suited to carry on the Anglo-American role played so deftly by Peabody and Junius. It was inevitable that the boy who would be trained in international finance and groomed to step into his father's shoes, the first move was to find employment for him in 1857 at the New York investment firm of Duncan, Sherman & Company. Seven years later, Junius acquired a competitor New York firm and set his son up as partner in Dabney Morgan & Company, which became the New York branch of the London firm. In 1871, with the addition of a third partner, Anthony Drexel from Philadelphia, the firm became Drexel Morgan & Company. In 1895, following the death of Drexel, there was a final change of name to J.P. Morgan & Company. A branch in Paris became known as Morgan, Horace & Company. Americanizing the New York branch. After the unexpected death of Junius in a carriage accident a few years later, it was decided by Pierpont to reshape the image of the London firm to be a more British operation. 
This would allow the New York branch to represent the American side with less suspicion of being essentially the same firm. By that time, his son, J.P. Morgan Jr., known as Jack by his friends, had already been brought into the firm as a partner, and he was to play an important role in the creation of that image. Biographer Jod Forbes tells us, J.P. Morgan Jr. became a partner in the London house of J.S. Morgan & Company in January 1st, 1898. And a fortnight later, with his wife, Jesse, and their three children, he left New York and took up residence in England for the next eight years. Morgan was sent to London to do two specific things. The first was to learn at first hand how the British carried on a banking business under a central banking system dominated by the Bank of England to set up the future Federal Reserve System and understanding of the Federal Reserve System. Morgan Sr. anticipated the establishment of the Federal Reserve System in the United States and wanted someone who would eventually have authority in the Morgan firms to know how such a system worked. The second was quietly to look about the city and select British partners to convert the elder Morgan's privately owned J.S. Morgan & Co. into a British concern. This eventually was accomplish, accomplished by the addition of Edward Grenfell, a longtime director of the Bank of England, as the new senior partner of what became Morgan, Grenfell & Company. But none of this window dressing altered the reality that J.P. Morgan & Co. in New York remained more British in orientation than American. A casual reading of the events of this period would lead to the conclusion that Peabody and Morgan were fierce competitors of the Rothschilds. It is true they often bid against each other for the same business, but it is also true that almost every biographer has told how the American newcomers to London were in awe of the great power of the Rothschilds and how they purposely cultivated their friendship, a friendship that eventually became so intimate that the Americans were received as personal house guests of the Rothschilds. The Morgan firm often worked closely with the House of Rothschild on large joint ventures, but that was, and still is, common practice among large investment houses. In the light of subsequent events, however, it is appropriate to consider the possibility that an arrangement had been worked out in which the Peabody Morgan firm went one step further and on occasion became a secret Rothschild agent. Some writers have suggested that the clandestine relationship began almost from the beginning. Eustace Mullins, for example, writes, Soon after he arrived in London, George Peabody was surprised to be summoned to an audience with the gruff Baron Nathan Mayer Rothschild. And George Peabody, again, was the precursor, was the guy who recruited Junius Morgan, and then his son, um, John Pierpont, is the J.P. Morgan we now know. And Nathan, <laughs> Baron Nathan Mayer Rothschild from, if you go back to episode, would be that be episode 11, which would be part two of The Creature from Jekyll Island, Nathan, uh, Nathan Rothschild was the British Rothschild, British Baith Rothschild, who basically, through his machinations with some of his other brothers, created the, the Bank of England, the so-called Central Bank of, of England, and was, a, was an incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful individual. Again, we're talking about people here through manipulation of money who have achieved dominance over humanity at this time, 1800s, more dominance over humanity than anyone had probably until that time. Very impressive stuff. So of course these guys are going to be the, the Morgans, the newcomers are going to be in awe of these, of these people. So we have Nathan Rothschild meeting George Peabody. Without mincing words, Rothschild revealed to Peabody that much of the London aristocracy openly disliked Rothschild and refused his invitations. He proposed that Peabody, a man of modest means, be established as a lavish host whose entertainments would soon be the talk of London. So these guys are already incredibly good at manipulating and psychological warfare, as one could interpret it. Rothschild would, of course, pay all the bills. P Peabody accepted this offer and soon became known as the most popular host in London. So again, Peabody is going to establish the Morgans in power. The Rothschilds are establishing Peabody into power. <clears throat> His... Annual 4th of July dinner celebrating American independence became extremely popular with the English aristocracy, many of whom, while drinking Peabody's wine, regaled each other with jokes about Rothschild's crudities and bad manners, without realizing that every drop they drank had been paid for by the Rothschild. Mullins does not give a reference for the source of this story, and one cannot help being skeptical that such details could be proved. Nevertheless, a secret arrangement of this kind is not as absurd as it may sound. There is no question that the Rothschilds were quite capable of such a clandestine relationship, and in fact, this is exactly the kind of deception for which they had become famous.
famous. Furthermore, there was ample reason for them to do so. A strong anti-Semitic and anti-Rothschild sentiment had grown up in Europe and the United States, and the family often found it to its advantage to work through agents rather than to deal directly. Derek Wil Wilson tells us, the name Rothschild was thus beginning to be heard in places far removed from sophisticated London and Paris, but the connection with the great bankers was sometimes tenuous. A tenuous connection was precisely the role to be played by August Belmont in the United States, and the anti-Semitism he found there was undoubtedly the reason he changed his name from Schoenberg to Belmont upon landing in New York in 1837. And Belmont was big in, as a Rothschild agent. We went over this in the last episode, setting up Rothschild interests, especially in the South, um, to have the Rothschilds have established some control there. The Rothschilds, maybe it may be the only time in the recent history that the Rothschilds have lost was, and their interest kind of lost was with the Civil War, but they didn't really lose, as we talked about last episode. Prior to that, the Rothschild agent had been the firm of J.L. and S.I. Joseph and Company, about as American sounding as one can get. It was not long, however, before the Belmont Rothschild connection became common knowledge, and they ploy and the ploy ceased to be effective. In 1848, the family decided to send Alphonse Rothschild to the United States to check on Belmont's operations and to evaluate the possibility of replacing him with a direct Rothschild representative. Perhaps Alphonse himself, after extended perhaps Alphonse himself. After an extended visit, he wrote home. In a few years from now, America will have attracted to itself the greater part of the trade of trade with China and the Indies and will be enthroned between the two oceans. The country possesses such elements of prosperity that one would have to be blind not to recognize them. I have no hesitation in saying that a Rothschild house and not just an agency should be established in America. Today, we are presented with a fine opportunity. Later on, difficulties will of necessity arise as a result of competition from all sides. Some historians have expre expressed amazement over the fact that the recommendation was never acted upon. Wilson says, this was the greatest opportunities the Rothschild, greatest opportunity the Rothschilds ever lost. Those with a more skeptical bent are tempted to wonder if the opportunity really was lost or if it was merely taken in a more indirect fashion. It is significant that, precisely at this time, George Peabody was making a name for himself in London and had established a close relationship with Nathan Rothschild. It is possible that the Peabody firm was given the nod from the Rothschild Consortium to represent them in America. Is it possible? Yes, certainly possible. And it is possible that the plan included allowing Belmont to operate as a known Rothschild agent while using Peabody and Company as an unknown agent, thus providing their own competition. John Moody answers, the Rothschilds were con content to remain a close ally of Morgan rather than a competitor as far as the American field was concerned. Gabriel Kokel says, Morgan's activities in 1895 to 1896 in selling U.S. gold bonds in Europe were based on his alliance with the House of Rothschild. Serino Pratt says, these houses may, like J.P. Morgan and Company, represent here the great firms and institutions of Europe, just as August Belmont and Company have long represented the Rothschilds. And George Wheeler writes, part of the reality of the day was an ugly resurgence of anti-Semitism. Someone was needed as a cover. Who better than J.P. Morgan, John Pupont Morgan, a solid Protestant exemplar of capitalism, able to trace his family back to pre-revolutionary times? Indeed, who better? While these considerations, with these considerations as background, the meteoric rise of Morgan Starr over London and Wall Street can be readily understood. It is no longer surprising, for example, that Peabody and Company was the sole American investment firm to receive a gigantic loan from the Bank of England during the U.S. Panic of 1857, a loan which not only saved it from sinking, but made it possible to salvage many other ships that were seized on Wall Street. So... And I also note in here that when uh, J.P. Morgan passed away, J.P. Morgan Sr. died in 1913, people were shocked to learn that his estate was only valued at $68 million, a paltry sum compared to the fortunes held by the Vanderbilts, Astors, and Rockefellers. And then it was uh, one of the other Morgan children died with only like $16 million in, uh, in their inheritance, despite them moving, at, at that time, billions and billions and billions of dollars. We detailed that stuff in episode two of 
uh, part two, excuse me, of the creature from Jekyll Island, how the Morgans were moving money for both the American interests as well as British interests during the World War One era. So th this data here suggests that the Morgan Morgans were essentially a front for the House of Rothschild. So very interesting. And now the Morgan House has been taken over, at least the Morgan banking has been taken over by Skull and Bones, according to Anthony Sutton. So it's interesting that you have this American secret establishment of Skull and Bones, and then you have the group over in Britain, Britain-based group, using the you know the the Royal Institute for International Affairs, which creates the the United Nations Council of Foreign Relations, is the offshoot of that. So it's like you have these two incredibly powerful mafias that no one knows about running things, and sometimes it seems like they clash, but quite clearly they both want a one world governmental system and boy are they achieving it the next chapter is called competition is a sin which is a famous rockefeller saying and the information at the end of this book is so juicy we're not really i'm only going to read the summary of these next two chapters but please buy a book buy this book for yourself think for yourself what if i'm wrong and also you'll be skipping over a lot of fascinating history and information that people should know Competition is a sin. Chapter 21. Summary. Banking in the period immediately prior to passage of the Federal Reserve Act was subject to a myriad of controls, regulations, subsidies, and privileges at both the federal and state levels. Popular history portray portrays this period as one of unbridled competition and free banking. It was, in fact, a halfway house to central banking. Wall Street, however, wanted more government participation. New York bankers particularly wanted a lender of last resort to create unlimited amounts of fiat money for their use in the event they were exposed to bank runs or currency drains. They also wanted to force all banks to follow the same inadequate reserve policies so that more cautious ones would not draw down the reserves of the others. An additional objective was to limit the growth of the new banks in the South and West. This was a time of growing enchantment with the idea of trusts and cartels. For those who had already made it to the top, competition was considered chaotic and wasteful. Wall Street was snowballing into two major banking groups, the Morgans and the Rockefellers, and even they had largely ceased competing with each other in favor of a cooperative financial structure. But to, but to keep these cartel combines from flying apart, a means of discipline was needed to force the participants to abide by the agreements. The federal government was brought in as a partner to serve that function. To sell the plan to Congress, the cartel reality had to be hidden and the name central bank had to be avoided the word federal was chosen to make it sound like it was a government operation and that works so well on virtually everyone doesn't it the word reserve was chosen to make it appear financially sound and the word system the first draft used the word association was chosen to conceal the fact that it was a central bank a structure of 12 regional institutions was conceived as a further ploy to create the illusion of decentralization, but the mechanism was designed from the beginning to operate as a central bank closely molded, modeled after the Bank of England. The first draft of the Federal Reserve Act was called the Aldrich, Aldrich Bill and was co-sponsored by Congressman Vreeland, but it was not the work of either of these politicians. It was the brainchild of banker Paul War Warburg and was actually written by bankers Frank Vin Vanderlip and Benjamin Strong. Aldrich's name was attached to the banking bill. Aldrich's name attached to the banking bill was bad strategy because he was known as a Wall Street senator. His bill was not politically acceptable and was never released from committee. The groundwork had been done. However, and the time had arrived to change labels and political parties. The measure would now undergo minor cosmetic surgery and reappear under the sponsorship of a politician whose name would be associated in the public mind with anti-Wall Street sentiments. Summary of chapter 22 is the, cre the chapter 22 is the creature swallows Congress. The second attempt to pass legislation to legal legalize the banking cartel, the banker's selection of Woodrow Wilson as a presidential candidate, their strategy to get him elected, the role played by Wilson to promote the cartel's legislation, the final passage of the Federal Reserve Act. <clears throat> Here we go. The creature swallows Congress. Summary. President Taft, although we're in President Taft, this is what these, I don't, it's interesting. This would be so interesting to delve into the history of these, 
like a, a very detailed. I'm sure there are, well, maybe not some like Anthony Sutton's, but because President Taft was the son of Alphonsus Taft, who was the man who helped, who founded the Skull and Bones Society with William Russell. Alfonso, uh, so William Howard Taft, who was the president, was kicked out at this time. Actually, he was running for president. He was running for re-election. And they were like, yeah, you're not going to even be the Republican nominee. We're going to get, uh, or you're not going to be the president. We're going to get Woodrow Wilson to run against you. And then they also ran Theodore Roosevelt as well to really split the vote to make sure that Woodrow Wilson won this election because President Taft was against this banking schema that they were bringing in. But President Taft was a massively high ranking individual without question within the, the secret society of the skull and bones. And he became the chief justice of the United States of America. He was the first person and the only person ever to be both president and chief justice of the Supreme court. So fascinating. He also started the, an international organization of international law, which some say was a precursor to the league of nations, which was the precursor to the United nations. So very interesting history here. <clears throat> president Taft, although a Republican spokesman, for big business, refused to champion the Aldrich bill for a central bank. This marked him for political extinction. The money trust wanted a president who would aggressively promote the bill, and the man selected was Woodrow Wilson, who had already publicly declared his allegiance. Wilson's nomination at the Democratic National Convention was secured by Colonel House. I think last episode I was calling him General Mandel House. It's Colonel Mandel House, so that's kind of a silly mistake to make. Um, Colonel House, a close associate of Morgan and Warburg. To make sure that Taft did not win his bid for re-election, the Money Trust encouraged the former Republican president, Teddy Roosevelt, to run on the progressive ticket. The result, as planned, was that Roosevelt pulled away Republican support from Taft and Wilson won the election with less than a majority vote. Wilson and Roosevelt campaigned vigorously against the evils of the Money Trust while all along being dependent upon that same trust for campaign funding. When Wilson was elected, Colonel House literally moved into the White House and became the unseen president of the United States. Under his guidance, and this chapter goes in a lot of secret meetings that he was having with the high-ranking British banking elite and, and governmental elite. So Colonel House, as we detailed, I believe it was yeah episode two, or excuse me, part two of The Creature from Jekyll Island, Colonel House really was the power in the White House, and Woodrow Wilson was absolutely a pushover on American scumbag, quite simply. And the um, the episode on the skull and bones has a lot more to detail on Woodrow Wilson as well. Under his guidance, the Aldrich bill was given cosmetic surgery and emerged as the Glass Owen bill. Although sponsored by Democrats, in all essential features, it was still the Jekyll Island plan. Aldrich, Vanderlip, and others identified with Wall Street put on a pretense of opposing the Glass-Owen bill to convince Congress and the public that big bankers were fearful of it. The final bill was written with many sound features which were included to make it palatable during congressional debate, but which were pre-designed to be dropped in later years. To win the support of the populists under the leadership of William Jennings Bryan, the Jekyll Island team also engineered what appeared to be compromises, but which in actual operation were, as Wilson called them, more, mere shadows, while the substance remained. In short, Congress was outflanked, outfoxed, and outclassed by a deceptive but brilliant psychopolitical attack. The result is that on December 23rd, 1913, America once again had a central bank. And that is, again, still the one that is in operation to date. The Great Duck Dinner. Now we're going to get into some of the immediate history after the inception of our Federal Reserve Bank and the evil schemes that they used to prop up the English, English economy at the expense of the American economy, which resulted in the Great Dep Depression. Did that harm anyone? Of course it did. So we're talking again about a history of crimes, absolute crimes. These guys schemed for World War One. they schemed for World War Two. In the meantime here, they're scheming the Great Depression to prop up their banking buddies and to make the British pound stronger and to send gold over to Britain to get it out of the very wealthy nation of the United States. The Great Duck Dinner is the name of this chapter. Congress had been assured that the Federal Reserve Act would decentralize banking power away from Wall Street, 
However, within a few years of its inception, the system was controlled by the New York Reserve Bank under the leadership of Benjamin Strong, whose name was synonymous with the Wall Street Money Trust. During the nine years before the crash of 1929, the Federal Reserve was responsible for massive expansion of the money supply. A primary motive for that policy was to assist the government of Great Britain to pay for its socialist programs, which by then had drained its treasury. By devaluing the dollar and depressing interest rates in America, investors would move their money to England where rates and values were higher. Only makes sense. That strategy succeeded in helping Great Britain for a while, but it set in motion the forces that made the stock market crash inevitable. The money supply expanded throughout this period, but the trend was interspersed with short spasms of contraction, which were the result of attempts to halt the expansions. Each resolve to use restraint was broken by the higher political agenda of helping the governments of Europe. In the long view, the result of plentiful money and easy credit was a wave of speculation in the stock market and urban real estate that intensified with each passing month. There is circumstantial evidence that the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve had concluded at a secret meeting in February of 1929 that a collapse in the market was inevitable and that the best action was to let nature take its course. Immediately after that meeting, the financiers sent advisory warnings to lists of preferred customers, wealthy industrialists, prominent politicians, and high officials in the foreign governments to get out of the stock market. Meanwhile, the American people were being assured that the economy was in sound condition. We're always lied to. We always have been lied to, but a great many subjects. It's the crux of this whole show, Open Secrets, is to show us and how many different ways we've been lied to, been manipulated, been deceived, and to make us totally dependent on a fake system based on lies. On August 9th, the Federal Reserve applied the pin to the bubble. It increased the bank loan rate and began to sell securities in the open market. Both actions have the effect of reducing the money supply. Because again, what's happening here is that securities are bonds. Bonds, when this mandrake mechanism, this fake mechanism we covered in part one of The Creature from Jekyll Island is the Federal Reserve purchases bonds, which is government, you know, government bonds to say government debt. And as a result, they call that an asset and then they print money. They print money based on this system. It's not logical, but that's how it works. But those bonds are called securities. And when they start selling these securities, when they start increasing rates of loans, less loans are happening, less money is being created. In fact, it's being stripped, taken away from the economy because it is a debt-based system. And when they start purchasing, um, where they start selling this debt, they want the money back. So money in circulation goes down. So, uh, yeah, selling securities in the open market, both actions have the effect of reducing the money supply. Rates on brokers' loans jumped to 20%. 20%. That's amazing. On October 29th, the stock market collapsed. Thousands of investors were wiped out in a single day. The insiders who were forewarned had converted their stocks into cash while prices were still high. They now became the buyers. Some of the greatest fortunes in America were made in that fashion. I will read one little page that I thought was interesting in here, although, it's again, it's all interesting. <laughs> here we go. Agents of a higher power. Why? Like, so why does it, he's answering the question here. Why does do people who are ostensibly American do things like cause the Great Depression that is absolutely not in the best interest of America or Americans? Agents of a higher power. When reviewing this aspect of the Fed's history, questions arise about the patriotic loyalty of men like Benjamin Strong. How is it possible for a man who enjoys the best that his nation can offer, security, wealth, prestige, to conspire to plunder his fellow citizens in order to assist politicians of other governments to continue plundering theirs. The first part of the answer was illustrated in earlier sections of this book. International money managers may be citizens of a particular country, but to many, to many of them, that is a meaningless accident of birth. They consider themselves to be citizens of the world first. They speak of affection for all mankind, but their highest loyalty is to themselves and their profession. That is only half the answer. It must be remembered that the men who pull 
pulled the financial levers of this doomsday machine, the governors of the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve were themselves tied to strings which were pulled by others above them. Their minds were not obsessed with concepts of nationalism or even internationalism. He can go further here and just say even humans. He doesn't. They do not care about you or me. They do not care. They they serve their very 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 powerful masters, and in themselves, in return, they are rewarded and were rewarded greatly. So they don't care about us. That's a hallmark of psychopathic action. Their loyalties were to men. Professor Quigley reminds us. It must not be felt that these heads of the world's chief central banks were themselves substantive powers in world finance. They were not. They were not. Rather, they were the technicians and agents of the dominant investment bankers of their own countries who had raised them up and were perfectly capable of throwing them down. The substantive financial powers of the world were in the hands of these investment bankers, also, also called international or merchant bankers, who remained largely behind the scenes in their own unincorporated private banks. These formed a system of international cooperation and national dominance, which was more private, more powerful, and more secret than that of their agents in the central banks. So we are not dealing with the actions of men who perceive themselves as betraying their nation, but technicians who are loyal to the monetary scientists and the political scientists who raise them up. Of the two groups, the financiers are do dominant. Po politicians come and go, but those who wield the power of money remain to pick their successors. And this has been true for a very, very, very long time now, well before you or I were on planet, planet Earth. This must be understood. We need a new change in system. Do not put your faith in any of these politicians on TV. They will not save you. I don't care how good they're made to look, how it looks like the system is against them. They are there because these guys want them there. It is drama. Politicians, politics is drama across the vast majority of the globe now. We must understand that. Now we're going to get into the real juicy information. And I'm going to read a lot from this next chapter because it's very cool. Very, I think more inter maybe it's more interesting information to me. It might not be to you. So again, read the book. But this chapter is called Doomsday Mechanisms. We're going to get a lot into the hows and whys and whats. Even more. This is a fantastic book, so I highly recommend you go read it. Summary of the doomsday mechanisms. The United States government is mired in $5.8 trillion debt. This was written in 1990. I think this was resummarized in 2008. Maybe that's where this is coming from. We are now at, I think, just under $30 trillion of debt. Much of it, that new debt was created within the last two years since COVID. So these presidents, who are they serving? How much of this was created in serving this beast system was by people who are ostensibly presidents who are ostensibly against it. Think very carefully about this stuff. By 2001, interest payments on that debt were running 360 billion per year, 360 billion per year. That consumes about 19% of all fe federal revenue and costs an average family over $5,000 each year. Scandalous folks, scandalous. Nothing is purchased by it. It merely pays interest. It represents the government's largest single expense. Interest on the national debt is already consuming more than 36% of all revenue collected from personal income taxes. If the long-term trend continues, there is nothing to prevent it from eventually consuming all of it. By 1992, there were more people working for government than for manufacturing companies in the private sector. There are more citizens receiving government checks than there are paying income taxes. When it is possible for people to vote on issues involving the transfer of wealth, wealth to themselves from others, the ballot box becomes a weapon whereby the majority plunders the minority. That is the point of no return. It is a doomsday mechanism. By 1992, more than half of all federal outlays went for what are called entitlements. Here is another doomsday mechanism. Entitlements are expenses such as, so as Social Security and Medicare, which are based on promises of future payments. Entitlements represent 52% of federal outlays. 
52%. When this is added to the 14% that is now being spent for interest payments on national debt, we come to the startling conclusion that two thirds of all federal expenses are now entirely automatic. And that percentage is growing each month. The biggest doomsday, doomsday mechanism of all is the Federal Reserve System. Every cent of our money supply came into being for the purpose of being loaned to someone. Those dollars will disappear when the loans are paid back. If we tried to pay off the national debt, our money supply would be undermined. Under the Federal Reserve System, therefore, Congress would be fearful to eliminate the national debt, even if it wanted to. Political environmentalism has caused millions of acres of timber and agri agricultural land to be taken out of production. Heavy industry has been chased from our shores by our own government. High taxes, rules beyond reason for safety devices in the workplace, so-called fair employment practices, and mandatory health insurance are rapidly destroying what is left of the private sector. The result is unemployment and dislocation for millions of American workers. Government moves in to fill the void it creates, and bureaucracy grows by the hour, and as we know from Lippmann and Adorno, when bureaucracy grows, bureaucracy exists only to propagate itself and to get more power into the bureaucracy. And what happens is this thing being administrated by this bureaucracy, be it science, be it agriculture, be it any number of things, those things get destroyed. So science is destroyed by the bureaucracy that controls it. That is absolutely what has happened. And our federal government now is an overwhelming bureaucracy that the USSR would have been incredibly jealous of. Federal taxes now take more than 40% of our private incomes. State, county, and local taxes are on top of that. Inflation feeds on what is left. We spend half of each year working for the government. Real wages in America have declined. Young couples with a single income have a lower standard of living than their parents did. The net worth of the average household is falling. The amount of leisure time is shrinking. The percent and, and leisure time is totally controlled by culture, culture industry. Check out that episode, The Culture Industry by Theodore. It's two episodes, Theodore Adorno. Check it out. The percentage of Americans who own their home is dropping. The age at which a family acquires a first home is rising. The number of families counted among the middle class is falling. The number of people living below the officially defined poverty level is rising. More and more Americans are broke at age 65. None of this is accidental. None of this is accidental. It is the fulfillment of a plan by members of the CFR who compromise who comprise, excuse me, the hidden government of the United States. Their goal is the deliberate weakening of the industrialized nations as a prerequisite bringing to bringing them into a world government built upon the principles of socialism with themselves in control. The origin of many of the stratagems in this plan can be traced to a government-sponsored think tank study released in 1966 called Report from Iron Mountain. The purpose of the study was to analyze methods by which a government can perpetuate itself in power, ways to control its citizens and prevent them from rebelling. The conclusion of the report was that, in the past, war has been the only reliable means to achieve that goal. Under world government, however, war technically would be impossible. So the main purpose of the study was to explore other methods, methods for controlling populations and keeping them loyal to their leaders. It was concluded that a suitable substitute for war would require a new enemy, which posed a frightful threat to survival. Neither the threat nor the enemy had to be real. They merely had to be believable. That's, and he's going to talk about, we're going to get into the environmental aspect of that. And of course, the evolution of the environmental aspect while it's being used at the same time is the viral threat. And it has to be believable. It's so important. It has to be believable. And if you can, on their end, supply part of the threat by changing environment or by creating literally in labs viruses that can be released to give even more plausibility to what's going to, to, to them, to the, the, the threat of a virus, which is what they've done under COVID-19, of course, then it becomes even more believable. People can become more fearful and thus be more easily manipulated. So several circuits for war were considered, but the only one holding real promise was the environmental pollution model. That was from 1966 report. Ron. We're going to get into that. But of course, again, I just mentioned COVID-19 and the viral idea is another evolution of this. This was viewed as the most likely to succeed because one, it could be related to observable conditions such as smog and water pollution. In other words, it would be based partly on fact and therefore believable. And two, predictions could be made showing end of earth scenarios just as horrible as atomic warfare. 
accuracy in these predictions would not be important. Of course, everything that they did scientifically to 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 countermand COVID nineteen was a joke, right? A joke, absolute not nothing scientific about it. Their purpose would be to frighten, not to inform. Does that sound familiar? While the followers of the current environmental movement are preoccupied with visions of planetary doom, the leaders have an entirely different agenda. It is world government. And let's get into some of these details here. <clears throat> By 2006, gross interest payments on the national debt were running $406 billion per year. That consumed about 17% of all federal revenue. It now represents the government's largest single expense, greater than defense, larger than the combined cost of the departments of agriculture, education, energy, housing, and urban development, interior, justice, labor, state, transportation, and veterans affairs. These charges are not paid by the government. They are paid by you, me, and all of us. You provide the money through taxes and inflation. The cost currently is about $5,000 for each family of four. All families pay through inflation, but not all pay taxes. The cost to each taxpaying family, therefore, is higher. On average, over $5,000 is extracted from your family each year, not to provide government services or even to pay off previous debts. Nothing is produced by it, not even roads or government buildings. No welfare or medical benefits come of it. No salaries are paid by it. The nation's standard of living is not raised by it. It does nothing except pay interest. Furthermore, the interest is compounded, which means even if the government were to completely stop its deficit spending, the total debt would continue to grow as a result of interest on that portion which already exists. In 2010, interest on the national debt was already consuming 44% of the revenue collected by personal income taxes. We are paying for this beast, ladies and gentlemen. We have been manipulated into paying for this beast. This is slavery. It is they are taxing your energy and your creative energies and production capacity. They're taxing it to bring in world government and to lower our standard, our standard of living, to make us accept lower and lower um, standards of living as each successive generation passes. What are we going to give to our children if we don't stop this? They're going to stop it for us. They're going to have a new thing coming in, which, which they're doing now. <clears throat> government is growing larger not smaller. By 2008, outlays of the federal government were one-fourth of the nation's economy. Nearly twice as many people now work for government than for manufacturing companies in the private sector. There are more bank regulators than bankers, more farm bureau workers than farmers, more welfare administrators than recipients, more citizens receive government checks than those who pay income taxes. By 1996, welfare benefits in 29 states were higher than the average secretary's wage. And in six states, they were more than the entry-level wage for computer programmers. When people can vote for the transfer of wealth to themselves, the ballot box becomes a weapon by which the majority plunders the minority. That is the point of no return, which are, we are well past. The point where the doomsday mechanisms begins to accelerate until the system self-destructs. The plundered grow weary of carrying the load and eventually join the plunderers. In the end, only the state remains. That's Hegelian principle. The state is God. We talked about that in the Skull and Bones episode. Check it out. The, these guys operate on a Hegelian mechanism by which everyone must be subservient to the state. It's the philosophy. It's the dominating philosophy they use anyway. In the end, only the state remains. And it's, of course, banking masters. The doomsday mechanism is also operating within government itself. By 2010, the average federal worker was earning 60% more than the average worker in the private sector. And I noticed this, too, when I tried my hand at postdoctoral work as a scientist. It was much better paycheck, much, much, much better paycheck to go work for the federal government than to work for the um, uh, postdoctoral fellowship at a college somewhere. That's one of the reasons I did it. Another reason was I, the, 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 I wanted to you know, work on the specific machine and learn how to use it. I'm glad I got out of that. Um, but they make it much more lucrative to work for government because if you have a lot more people working for government, government becomes bigger and a lot more people become beholden directly. Their livelihoods are tied to the government. The government thus consumes your society. By 1992, more than half of all federal outlays went for entitlements. 
Those are expenses, Medicare, Social Security, and retirement programs based on promises of future payment. That does not mean they cannot be eliminated. For example, entitlements include $24 billion per year for food stamps. There is no contractual obligation to continue those, only political expediency. By now, sorry, my hand's covering. By now, most Americans have stood in grocery lines and watched the well-dressed customer in front of them use food stamps for ice cream and pretzels, pay cash for two bottles of wine, and then drive away in a late model car. The political function of the food stamp program is not to help the hungry, but to buy votes. The programs that do involve contractual obligations, such as Social Security and Medicare, could be turned over to private firms, which would not only operate them more efficiently, but also would pay out higher benefits. Congress, however, does not dare to touch any of these entitlements for fear of losing votes. Normally, with contracts for future obligations of this kind, the issuer is required to, by law to accumulate money into a fund to make sure there will be enough available when future payments become due. The federal government does not abide by those laws. The funds exist only on paper. The money that comes in for future obligations is immediately spent and replaced by a government IOU. So, as the future payments come due, all of the money must come from revenue being collected at that time. Herein lies the doomsday mechanisms. These obligations will be paid out of future taxes or inflation. Entitlements currently represent 52% of all federal outlays, and they are growing at a rate of 12% each year. When this is added to the 14% that is now being spent for interest payments on the national debt, we come to the startling conclusion that two-thirds of all federal expenses are now entirely automatic, and that percentage is growing each month. Even if Congress were to stop all of the spending programs in the normal budget, dismantle the armed forces, close down all of its agencies and bureaus, stop all of its subsidies, and board up all of its buildings, including the White House, it would be able to reduce its present spending by only one-third. Think about that. Stunning. And even that small amount is shrinking by 10 to 12 percent per year. That is a best case scenario. The real case is that Congress is accelerating its discretionary spending, not canceling it out. One does not have to be a statistical analyst to figure out where this trend is headed. The biggest doomsday mechanism of all, however, is the Federal Reserve System. It will be recalled that every cent of our money supply, including coins, currency, and checkbook money, came into being for the purpose of being lent to someone. All of those dollars will disappear when the loans are paid back. They exist only so long as the debt behind them exists. Underneath the period of, period, excuse me, pyramid of money supporting the entire structure are the so-called reserves, which represent the Fed's monetization of debt. If we tried to pay off the national debt, those reserves also would start to disappear, and our money supply would be undermined. The Fed would have to scramble into the world money markets and replace U.S. securities with bonds from corporations and other countries. Technically, that can be done, but the effect would be devastating. Congress would be fearful to eliminate the national debt, even if it wanted to. These are the doomsday mechanisms in operation. If we do not understand how they function, we will not be prepared for our trip into the future. Because he's going to talk about some future scenarios coming up. The scenes that will unfold there will be too bizarre. The events are too shocking. We would be convinced that something surely had gone wrong with our time machine. And that's the time machine's just kind of mechanism he uses as he's flip-flopping throughout history here. Who owns the national debt? It has been said that we need not worry ourselves about interest on the national debt because we owe it to ourselves. Let's take a look at who owes what to whom. The Fed, for many years, held only about 9% of the national debt. Agencies of the federal government held 28%. Foreign investors own approximately 43%, 2002 figures. And private sector investors in the U.S. held the balance. By 2010, foreign investors had lost confidence in the U.S. ability to make good on its IOUs and ceased to bid on treasury auctions. The Fed was obligated to monetize the difference, that is, create, debt, create money out of nothing, and by August was purchasing 80% of the debt. It is partly true we owe ourselves, we owe it to ourselves, but it is more accurate to say that all of us owe it to some of us. The some of us are private investors seeking income that is exempt from state income taxes and large institutions such as banks, corporations, insurance companies, and investment funds. In other words, guys who really, the, the private guys the, the, that own these big private banks, 
the guys who own the Federal Reserve. That's who those some are. With institution, institutions, the money represents pooled assets belonging to thousands of small investors. So a major portion of the interest on the national debt does indeed accrue to the benefit a, of a large sector, sector of the American people. That's the good news. The bad news is that the government obtains every cent of the money it pays to us by confiscating it from us, from us in the first place. If it is true that we owe it to ourselves, then it is also true that we pay it to ourselves. The money goes out of one pocket and back into the other, minus a handling fee. The government takes $1,000 from us in taxes and inflation and gives us back $350. The so-called benefit to the public is an illusion. And more bad news. When people purchase government bonds, there is less money available for investment in private industry. It is well known that the government credit crowds out private credit. The result is that the productive side of the nation is handicapped by unfair competition for investment capital. To obtain new money for growth, private companies must pay higher interest rates. These are passed on to the consumer in the form of higher prices. Many companies are forced to curtail their plans for expansion. Potentially new jobs are never created. Some companies are forced out of business altogether and their employment and their employees are put out of work. The economy is always retarded by government debt. The larger the debt, the greater the damage. The 43% portion of the national debt held by foreign investors is a huge bite. One trillion three hundred million dollars cannot be ignored, which of course would be much higher today, unless it's just the Federal Reserve buying our debt, which is possible. I'm not sure exactly what's happening now in 2022. These bonds could become a serious problem down the line as they mature. So far, they have been a partial blessing because they were purchased with money that already existed. Therefore, they were not inflationary. But it is not difficult to imagine future conditions under which bondholders would decide not to renew. What would happen if the stability of the government were to be questioned or if the productive capacity of the United States were to be challenged by, a massive, terrorist, by massive terrorist attacks? In order to pay off those bonds on maturity, the Treasury would have to issue new ones. The Federal Reserve would have to purchase the new bonds with fiat money. Therefore, foreign-held federal debt is a ticking time bomb. If it should ever have to be picked up by the Fed, the inflationary impact on our country would be staggering. I believe that is exactly what we are, are enduring right now. Now we're going to get some really juicy stuff here. Forgive me, I have to take a drink of my water here because this is going to be a pretty long episode. And my drying out here we go this is going to get into what's happening on the ground to your average family and some of the the mechanisms used to you know lower our standard of living in a 1999 report published by the economic policy institute rev revealed that the average middle class american family was working an average of six weeks more each year than when the study began in 1989 could you use an extra six weeks of vacation 1999, six weeks more work than in 1989. Yet this was still not enough. To maintain their old lifestyle, those families were consuming the last of their savings and going into debt. In 1999, the average personal savings rate finally became a negative 1%, which means that the facade of prosperity is now being paid for with borrowed money. The message here is that real wages in America have declined. Young couples with a single income now have a lower standard of living than their parents did. In spite of two incomes, the net worth of the average household is failing, is falling. For many, it has become negative. The percentage of Americans who own their own homes is dropping. Recall to mind the great reset, the, the new great reset mantra of you will own nothing and ha be happy by 2030. The percentage of Americans who own their, their homes is dropping. The age at which a family acquires a first home is rising. Mortgage foreclosures are increasing. The number of families in the middle class is falling. Savings accounts are smaller. Family debt is greater. The number of people below the officially defined poverty level is rising. The percentage of people working beyond age 65 is rising. There are as many personal bankruptcies as divorces. Most Americans are broke at age 65. Right here, the algorithm is becoming more precise now. Now they're getting it so that life's lifespan is coming down health span is certainly being destroyed that's the one story about lifespan they don't tell you they say oh people are still living to be 79 80 years old on average so everything's great hunky dory but people the last 10 years people live, live is in nursing homes where they're in a drug-induced state of sickness and eating garbage 
Why aren't nursing home foods, by the way, better for them? They should be giving them healthy food because they're loading them down with garbage. But, but so what I'm saying is the algorithm is coming more precise, especially with the COVID injections and people dying. At a, I just saw that 